Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World, where my throat is a little bit sore at the moment. This this intro has been recorded after the actual interview, so you're lucky that this isn't going to persist for the whole time, it's just for the next 30 seconds or so. This episode is with Braden Ream of Voice Flow, and we discuss that hot topic, that ever-present topic, discoverability. We discuss how to get people to your voice application and whether that falls down to the developer or the brand or whether that should fall down to Amazon or Google or the platforms and we discuss discoverability within the voice application itself so how do you get people used to and aware of the things that your voice application can do this episode is brought to you by the Conversational Academy so if you do want to become a conversation designer and learn the ropes there is no better place to start you will go from zero to conversation design hero check out the link in the show notes and visit conversationalacademy.com ladies and gentlemen without further ado this is Braden Ream of voice flow on VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. Branding with the big faces. I love listening to it. Kane Sims. Kane Sims. Kane Sims, the one and only. Britain's finest, Mr. Kane Sims. Dustin. Dustin. Dustin Coates. I like it when you guys are together and talking about voice. Without further ado, welcome to the show. Dustin. Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? Ah, bien, ¿y tú? Yeah, that's about the extent of it. Four years, five years in, in high school and college, and I think we've just tapped out my Spanish. <laughs> I'm so glad that you were the one that asked me that, because my Spanish runs out there as well. So if I had to ask you that and you responded, I would be the one saying the exact same thing. <laughs> Braden, hola. Hola, or bonjour, I should say. Ah, yes, yes, Dustin is over there in, in Paris, and also you're in Canada, so do you speak French? <laughs> I'm similar to that, that I speak uh, up until grade four and then I completely forgot everything. How does it work in in Canada? Because is the whole place isn't all French and English, is it? Is it certain parts? Yeah, so we have one province called uh, Quebec and uh, they speak, their first language is French and then the second is English and then the rest of the country is English uh, and then the secondary language is French. Um, so everyone has to know a little bit of French. Uh, you learn it in school, but uh, it's up to you whether you want to become fluent. Okay. So was French the first multi-language support for voice flow then? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't don't think so, but um, uh, maybe. (laughs) Well, you know, the the funny thing is, and I'm probably wading into something that's going to get me into trouble here. uh, The French might say that the Canadians don't really speak French. If you watch TV shows here in France and someone from Quebec appears on it, they add subtitles actually. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we, we have um, one of our awesome team members, uh, Nicholas, who a lot of voiceful users might be familiar with. Um, he's actually based in Paris, so he's real French. And um, when he came to visit us at Voice Summit in New Jersey, he was speaking, um, quote unquote, French with some of our team members who thought they were fluent and they found out they are not fluent. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I can definitely confirm that. Well, it is a long way for the language to travel. I'm sure that that uh, and over time as well. I'm sure. I'm sure things change change dramatically. Braden, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad we've finally done it. And I think we were just talking before and there that we were originally lining this up. I think it was like this, it was at the beginning of the year or the end of last year, something like that. We've been talking for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it, it has been a long time. I think in January I reached out because uh, you know we're big fans of the podcast, and so we wanted to try to get on. And uh, here we are, five or six months later. And it's it's a pleasure. I mean, you've done you've done the rounds lately as well in terms of uh, you know you you were on this week in Voice, you were on the uh, Design for Voice podcast, and pretty sure you were on VoiceBot as well relatively recently. So we've kind of completed the uh, the quadruple here, and uh, it's going to be an interesting <laughs> discussion because what we won't do is cover anything that you already covered in that, and we would definitely urge people to go and check those other podcasts out, and we'll put the links to those in the show notes. But before we do begin if there is any new listeners to VUX world or anybody who for some strange reason hasn't come across voice flow yet do you want to give us a bit of an intro into who you are Braden and tell us a little bit about voice flow yeah for sure so voice flow uh, is an online platform that makes it easy to design prototype and build voice apps for Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant that is the elevator pitch right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, I guess if you want me to go a little bit more into it, um, 
Yeah, so it's a drag and drop platform. You don't have to know any code to be able to use it. Uh, and we do have both hobbyists and professionals using VoiceFlow as, you know, it can be a really simple flow chart just for those who are just getting into uh, VUI design or just getting into the world of voice. But then we also scale the tool up and uh, it can also be used for professional use cases as well. Uh, so we have a, a wide range of awesome users from Fortune 500s all the way down to, uh, you know, people just getting into it. We've We've used it quite a bit over the months and I quite like the the drag and drop interface I like the way that you can kind of map out your kind of conversation tree and you can dip into flows as it's called in voice flow which is kind of like little sub sections and sub stories and stuff like that and then but it's not just the the drag and drop kind of cordless thing because you've increased uh, well in fact I think it started out this way to be honest in terms of being able to um, the kind of bridge that gap between development and sort of design so you can get away with doing some pretty technical stuff in there as well can you? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the original idea came from VoiceFlow when we were initially using some of these other tools when we were doing our own Alexa skill called StoryFlow, and we just found they weren't powerful enough. We wanted, um, so for example, the, the idea of subroutines or flows, as we call them, um, came from us uh, wanting to have stories with multiple chapters. Uh, the flow diagram was just getting way too way too gnarly. It was getting way too big. And so we thought, oh, like if only there's a platform that allowed us to split all these things up. Uh, and so that's where the idea, the idea from flows came. And when we want to do quizzes and more... Um, more challenging sort of skills, uh, we needed a really advanced logic system and we couldn't find that anywhere else as well. So we just decided to build our own platform. Why not? Um, So (laughs) today we were going to talk a little bit about um, the topic that comes up all the time and it seems to have to have kind of lingered for some for some while and in fact I'm just going to double check when the first time was when we spoke about this initial topic of discoverability and it was in fact Dustin believe it or not August the 6th 2018 with Georgia Quinter that sounds like the person who would have brought that up for the first time <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh, and and recently uh, I, I tweet I, mean, I wasn't it wasn't a tweet it was a linkedin post and uh, i was kind of i kind of made a bit of a statement which was saying you know discoverability is up to the brand or the creator of the voice experience and that we shouldn't be expecting a free meal because you know is it in Amazon's interest to help third party developers promote their skills or are they happy with everyone using it, using Alexa every single day for timers and calendars and text messaging or whatever it might be? And funnily enough, Joe, we had a really good discussion on there and Joe does have some really kind of decent points about how the platforms essentially hold all the cards and really from from his experience, which is extensive experience and being involved in the early days of, of Amazon Alexa and trying all kinds of different ways and, and, and ways to get people to his games and stuff like that and really the only thing seem, that seem to have done a real good job is uh, when Amazon have stepped in and um, and done something put them in the newsletter or something like that and I can totally see his point and I, I'm not disagreeing with that and I'm not saying that that there is a right or a wrong um, but what what are your thoughts on this whole subject Braden, what what are you, what are your observations of the voice industry right now from a discoverability perspective? Is it still a real challenge? Have we started to crack it? How how would you like? How what are your thoughts on on the discoverability topic? Yeah, I think I think um, discoverability is of course sort of the the biggest challenge uh, in the space right now um, because it really it's really sort of the um, the first problem that uh, creates a bunch of sub problems. So. Often the two that are talked about is discoverability, actually I guess the three, is discoverability, retention, and monetization. But really if discoverability was to be solved, these other two would sort of fall in line as well. And the reason I think this is if you had, uh, let's say, 10 million users coming into your voice app at the beginning of the month, then there's going to be a massive incentive to build a better uh, voice experience that's going to retain users longer. So then uh, companies would drive a lot of resources into retaining said users. And then from there, they're going to put time into, okay, so now that we've retained these users, let's actually figure out a way to monetize them. And so if you think of it sort of like a funnel, the top of the funnel, which is discoverability is paramount to actually building a really healthy ecosystem. All these other problems will be solved when discoverability is solved. And the way that we see it at VoiceFlow is there's really, 
um, two types of discoverability. There's uh, sort of explicit discoverability, which is newsletters. This is, um, you know, sharing on Facebook. This is telling people to come find your Alexa skill. And then there's implicit. And, you know, I, I was quoted last year um, when, you know, we were just starting VoiceFlow saying, I think this, you know, 2019 is going to be the year of implicit discovery. And so far I've been wrong. Um, implicit discovery has not come about. And uh, for, for those who might not be familiar with what I'm talking about when I say implicit discovery, you can sort of think of um, the early days of web when you had you know, millions and millions of websites, but um, unless you told people to go directly to your website, there was no way for them to find it. And then um, what started to happen was search engines came about and you started to search for intents. So you go, hey, I want to get a... Um, uh, I want to go on a cruise to uh, Miami or something like that, right? Um, and then it would find you a travel website. The search engine like Google or you know Bing or Yahoo or any of the, these other things were going to use your search intent and then find a website for you. Um, that search engine functionality has not yet been built in Alexa and Google Assistant, but they're trying to get there. And so there's uh, features like can fulfill intent, which essentially is, is you know, the, the search, search engine equivalent for Alexa. Um, and these are starting to pop up, but they're, they're not coming at nearly the pace that's needed. And so instead, what you're seeing a lot more of is um, developers are coming on and they're using Facebook and they're using the social platforms as the way to um, really try to get their, their voice apps out there. Um, and so for individual hobbyists and, you know, as you might describe, like the long tail, uh, it hasn't been really effective. And this is, again, then affected their retention and their monetization efforts. So that's been really bad. Um, but for big brands, what we've seen is they're actually able to use their brand power and their connections with Amazon to get on the newsletter, to get on the homepage. Um, and then also people are, uh, when you have a big brand, people are already asking for your brand on Alexa and Google, and you can use your own platforms to leverage it. And so we've seen a lot more success there. Um, um, so, you know, a brand like the New York Times, for example, people are just going to assume that they have an Alexa skill. So they might ask for the New York Times. Um, and yeah, so for big brands, uh, discoverability is a challenge, but they at least have their own solution using their own platforms and sort of, you know, bleeding into the voice space. Um, but we've seen a real problem with hobbyists for sure. So, Braden, it sounds like then that you feel that voice is going to be more similar to the web model than it will be the mobile model where uh, you discover these applications elsewhere and then go seek them out. It sounds like you're really hoping that it's going to be more search engine type behavior driving to the, uh, it's not a site, it's a skill or a, an action. Yeah. I, and um, I think, don't really see another way it could go. And I could be wrong, but the way I think about this is um, in every sort of application ecosystem, there's depth of engagement. This is, you know, how long a user is expected to stay within a particular application, um, you know, sort of how much time they're supposed to spend there. And then there's sort of the width of the ecosystem. How many different apps are there? Um, I think when you look at mobile, you know, really, um, past the early days where people might download a hundred apps and your iPhone would be filled up with like beer drinking apps and you know, gun shooting apps and like, you know, Zippo lighting apps. Like um, t t today you really only have maybe like 10 to 15 externally downloaded apps. And that's because mobile um, mobile apps are meant to be deeply engaging. The stats that they look at when they're um, valuing a mobile app might be um, how many users do you have? And then how long do they spend? What's their session length, right? That's what all these apps are uh, optimized to do. I think voice is a different paradigm just because the interface is different. And this might shift with APL and visuals and all these sorts of things. But for right now, when you think about voice, um, voice as an interface has a really good input speed for data, but it has a really bad output speed meaning that it's really fast to say what you want, but it's really, really slow to get back what you want. And so when you think of what that interface enables when it comes to that application, uh, this sort of application uh, ecosystem axis I was talking about before, that really favors itself to having millions and millions of voice apps, but very shallow engagement. The other thing is voice apps are cloud-based, meaning that there's no download, there's no friction. It's not like the app store where you have to download the front end onto your phone and then you can start using the app. With Alexa and Google, you can simply start asking for the apps you want. 
And so I think it makes a lot more sense that um, you would have these sort of long tail search queries. You would have a voice app for every particular niche little function that you might need. So on a mobile app ecosystem, you may have one app that tells you all the surf shops in North America. You download it once and use it everywhere. I think in voice, you may have a voice app that's specific to surf shops in Santa Barbara. It's a very niche function. It's very long tail. Um, but all you have to do is quickly ask for it and it's going to get, uh, get that information, information to you similar to like a landing page. Hmm. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I posted something along this kind of line, um, which was all around how in order for voice, the, well, let's take the assistant platforms, in order for that to, to be really successful over time, there needs to be enough there so, so as not to disappoint people when they try and find it and it's not there. So, and it sounds as though that's kind of what, what you're suggesting there in terms of you need to have a restaurant menu put together and a kitchen that's churning out food before you go away and try and get people to come into your restaurant. Do you think that discoverability in some cases is more of a breadth problem, as in there isn't just there isn't enough stuff that's there to match what people are asking for? Do you think that's part of the problem or, or not? Yeah, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, I think, so there's, on one end of the spectrum, you have sort of this death spiral where um, if people, so let's say there's, uh, out of all the apps out there, there's only a couple which are made for the long tail. So let's take the menu example you gave. Um, Unless I ask for that very specific menu, if I ask any other question to Alexa, I'm going to get a, hey, sorry, I don't know this. And so now the consumer is going to, you know, sort of have this negative reinforcement to not ask Alexa these long tail questions. Um, and that's just going to continue to, you know, proliferate as now it uh, encourages developers to not build long tail apps. And so I think what needs to happen is there just needs to be a massive increase in um, the number of these apps. And that can either come through um, uh, Alexa opening the floodgates a little bit more, uh, increasing the, the amount of um, invocations that come through implicit invocations so they can fulfill intent. Um, and maybe even just having a short list. And I think this is what they're trying to do right now, just having a short list of the number of apps that, that implicit invocation is going to lead to. Um, but that that's at least a start because there's there's it's sort of a two-sided marketplace. You need to have um, consumers who have that muscle memory of asking Alexa, not just silly random questions that are going to be scraped off the internet, but, um, or sort of the knowledge graph, but asking for intent based questions. So I want to do this thing rather than tell me about this thing. So we need to uh, have consumers shift their muscle memory there. And then on the flip side, we need to have enough developers building these sorts of experiences where, um, you know, we're actually able to supply, uh, the, the proper voice app to match that consumer's intent. So yeah, it's, it's certainly a tricky problem. And I think Amazon's going about it in the right way. Uh, I'm not as familiar with, with Google's efforts here, but knowing that Amazon is focusing on, creating a short list uh, first just to start to build up the muscle memory of demand. And then I think gradually you'll see um, uh, can fulfill intent be opened up wider and wider uh, to encourage developers. Do you think it's a Amazon slash Google problem or a user or developer slash brand problem, Dustin? As in, who really needs to be the one responsible for driving the traffic? Mm, yeah. I think it's interesting. I was actually a little surprised by the responses to your post because you put your neck out there a little bit. And I expected a lot of people to go, no, 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 no. Like, uh, it's, it's Amazon's responsibility. It's Google's responsibility. But I do think it's, it's a lot of our responsibility as well. Braden, you were mentioning can fulfill intent. Google has the implicit invocation as well. Uh, it's interesting to see the tooling that those two are providing. Google now, you can you can have a YouTube video uh, showing up on Assistant just by going in and creating a Google Sheet, right? So they're trying to make it incredibly easy to, to discover content. You can do the same with recipes. There's a a speakable markup in Google as well. I I wonder how much of it is is the retention side. Certainly, right? You need to to drive traffic to it. But I think anyone who has a website will also tell you that if you only rely on SEO, you're dead. 
right? You're absolutely dead because you're not getting that SEO traffic in the beginning anyway, because you don't have links to your site. Uh, and then if you overly rely on Google, let's say like, if you remember what happened with Rap Genius a few years back, is it was all lyrics websites, then they were discovered for doing something shady, Google penalized them and they lost a ton of traffic. I think it's going to be the same thing here. You really have to have a ton of different channels driving your way. Braden, something I was interested in your perspective is you were mentioning the brands have this built-in advantage, which is which is really the case everywhere, right? They have the built-in advantage there. But if we think about driving traffic to a skill from a hobbyist or a smaller a smaller outfit, do you think it would be better off to target that long tail or sorry, that organic implicit invocation traffic? Or do you think it would be better to really create a brand yourself within there? For example, are you creating an invocation name that is uh, stock prices or should you go the route of uh, super stock or something along those lines? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it's really tough to build a brand in the voice space right now. Um, I think voice branding is just starting to become more and more of a thing. But for, for the most part, I don't think you've seen many long tail sort of brands emerge. So, you know, some that would come to mind would be, uh, I think, you know, Invoked Apps has done an awesome job. I think Volley's done an awesome job and, and a bunch, a couple of other of these skill makers who didn't have an existing brand, but they've built a brand in the voice space. Um, I think that's really, really difficult though. And so, you know, kudos to, to the folks who've been able to do it successfully. Um, I do you think, don't do you, think. Do you think uh, that brand? Sorry, Ben. Do you think that those brands are recognised by the users of those apps, or do you think that's just known within the community because there's a pretty strong community? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Actually, does it matter to users um, if there's a new brands aspiring and popping up in voice? Do they? I think there are some power users who um, use a lot of Alexa skills. You know, I think I think it's sort of like the power law and that you'll have most people don't use that many skills, but the people who do use a lot of them. Um, and I think at that point, you know, they, they've started to do more of the visual branding, actually more, more so than audio branding, uh, where, you know, Volley has their gold rings, Invoked Apps has their little emblem. Uh, I do think it, uh, it has some recognition, but that, that's a good point. I actually don't know whether consumers care too, too much, especially if they're found by implicit invocation, then I don't, I don't think they know at all. What are you going to say, Dustin? Yeah, you know, Kane, it's actually interesting because I remember speaking with Nick a while back and he was starting to add some audio branding to his, to his skills and to his actions, which he's an interesting case because he started off very, very generic, right? It's sleep sounds, it's rain sounds, it's about as generic as you can get on an audio platform. But he started adding this little chime at the beginning of the sounds because he wanted his users to know or if they're arriving through implicit invocation, and this was primarily on the assistant platform at this time, he wanted people to know that, hey, this is this is an invoked app or invoked skills uh, skill that you're listening to. It was Audio UX that did that. Eric C, you've had on the show before. Uh, it was them, them that did that uh, Sonic logo. Um, you mentioned earlier on, Braden, that implicit invocations haven't taken off as much as you'd expect them to in this year. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I think um, Amazon has to walk a very fine line here. And, and you know, generally, when, just for disclosure, generally, generally when I speak, uh, uh, if I say Alexa or Amazon, this is actually what a lot, of the, a lot of what the community does. I'm actually referring to all the assistants or all sort of, all, all their ecosystems. It's just easier to, to use Alexa as sort of the, the talking point. Um, but yeah, I, I think Alexa has a really tough problem on their hands in that they want to encourage developers by increasing implicit invocation. But if it's not working flawlessly and if there isn't enough supply, then they're going to feed their customer with a bad experience and then they're not going to try it again. And so that's where I think they're walking that line of sort of using a short list of skills that they've they've um, deemed as quality and increasing the floodgate is right opening the floodgates for them just to getting uh, just to get consumers sort of, you know, into that muscle memory. But um, I think, you know, they have to open it up wider in order for developers to really sort of sink their teeth in. I, I think you're starting to see slower voice app, you know, the numbers of voice apps being developed is slowing. I think because discoverability is just 
um, it's, it's a really tough challenge. And so uh, Amazon's going to have to really move quickly to uh, open the floodgates and get more developers um, onto the, the list of sort of approved uh, implicit invocation skills. What are some of the have you have you um, have you got a, a spot on the floor near you at the moment, Bryden? A spot on the floor. A spot on the floor. Yeah, because we might put you on it. <laughs> oh. Put you on the spot. <laughs> boom, boom. That, right. That's a Friday afternoon joke. <laughs> what? What? You don't have to answer these if you don't want to. But mm-hmm. have you got any specific examples of where somebody? whether it's a brand, an agency, or an individual, using VoiceFlow has managed to acquire significant traffic, and how did they do it? You don't have to name yeah, names, but um, just if you do have any examples, that might be interesting. Sure, yeah. So we have one in particular, which um, uh, I would say definitely it blew up quite quickly. Um, and so this was a, a large company with a known brand that came on and they were using voice flow and they used this for three or four months uh, and they launched their skill. And when they launched it, they launched it in partnership with Amazon. And so they had uh, a banner on not only the Alexa skills page, but on a banner on the front page of amazon.com for a week. Um, and so that skill absolutely blew up uh, to say the least. Um, it was, um, a release in tandem with a very large motion picture that was, was launched. And um, we couldn't believe the, the numbers of traffic that got, that, uh, that got drove to it. Um, the amazon.com banner is no longer there. So the traffic isn't nearly as high. And I don't think the skill was meant for retention as much as sort of a one-off promotional get, uh, stunt, but um, yeah, we, we haven't seen, we haven't seen nearly as much success for um, uh, skills that don't have that explicit um, sort of marketing push. Um, but I, I will say, actually, you know what, let me, let me give one really good example. So there's a, a voice flow developer named Simon Landry, and I, I know he'd be comfortable with me um, talking about this. He has a skill called poop detective, and this is one of the most popular Alexa skills on the voice flow platform. So we have metrics in our office and on the wall, you'll see what the most popular skills are. Um, poop detective is always uh, up there. And I think the reason that it's done so well is it has a great uh, implicit invocation um, phrase. Uh, you know, it's literally like, it's like ask Alexa about my poop or whatever it might be. Uh, it's a scalable, repeatable use case. People, you know, generally go to the washroom one to two times a day. They have uh, their hands might be tied and they're in the washroom and a lot of echoes are in the washroom. Um, and it's a re- really amusing skill that uh, has a lot of variety in it. It's actually, it's actually very funny. It's, it's not sort of as much of a gimmick as, as you might think. Um, and so I think what it comes down to right now, if you want to become uh, really well known through implicit invocation is coming up with a great use case where voice makes a lot of sense and there might not be that much uh, competition. So fax skills, you know, there's going to be uh, 10,000 of them, right? Like you're not going to find implicit invocation through be- building a fax skill, but if you find a really good use case with um, an invocation that um, people are actually going to naturally ask for then I think, I think it'll definitely find success. And this is very similar to SEO keywords as well. I'm not familiar. Uh, I'm not sure if you, how familiar you guys are with um, sort of SEO keyword research, but you're generally trying to find a long tail phrase that um, there isn't that much competition for, but still has a very high intent. Like people actually want to search for this thing. And if they find your site, they're going to, they're going to use it. So um, I think it's, it's very similar to uh, input simplification on voice. So if I can summarize, then the best way to get traffic is to have a motion picture and be on the Amazon.com homepage or be about poop. Is that what you're saying, (laughs) Brayden? I I think that's um, that is definitely a more pessimistic way to say say it. But uh, I I think having a big brand will help for sure. Right. Um, But I think if you're a long tail developer, you can still build a business. Um, in voice, it's going to be a lot tougher. Like that's, that is the, that is the, the, the asterisks on this. Um, it's certainly good to get an earlier, but until discoverability is solved from an implicit standpoint, it's going to be really, really tough to get organic traffic. Um, so you're going to have to rely on your Facebook posts and all of these sort of social media posts. Um, and you know, I think there's the potential that if you have a really good skill, um, you might actually get, you know, retained users and word of mouth. But I think for the most part, um, yeah, you're going to have to rely on your own efforts for right now. Uh, talking about retaining users, we, you know, we talk a lot about getting users to a skill or getting to them to an action in the first place. 
But once they get there, you need to retain them or else all of that acquisition is for naught. And one of the challenges there when we talk about discovery is actually, what can I do once I get there? What can I do other than what brought me here? Do you have any advice for builders, for developers about how to let users know what they can even do? Yeah, uh, and I think this will change with visuals. So um, I think if we're talking in a purely voice setting, so like bilateral voice interface, um, I think the best way to do it is is you think about what what's the th- like what what is the, what are the, th- the thematic intents for your particular skill. So for example, if you are a flight booking skill, you should be covering every intent that would be uh, traditionally assumed with um, booking a flight, right? And you'll want to do a lot of user testing just to make sure that you're hitting you know, 80 to 90% of all the common intents. And then from there, uh, what you'll typically want to do is just make sure you have a response to each of these intents, right? So if someone wants to change their flight, book their flight, check for a flight, uh, check prices, if they want to I don't know, do anything else, you should be covering all of those. And then in the one scenario where um, they ask for something that you do not handle, you can, um, in the future, either use skill connections to pass them to a skill that can handle that particular uh, intent, or you'll use sort of the, you know, the narrowing principle of uh, then narrowing the user scope down and saying, sorry, we can't do that, but we can do X, Y, Z. Um, That's how voice design should be done today. Um, But again, in future, as visuals become uh, further incorporated, I think you're going to see... um, sort of intent discovery within a particular voice app become a lot more clear. It's going to be uh, very obvious what you can and cannot do just based off of what's on the screen. And you're basically using voice as a selector. Uh, It'll just be purely an input interface. And so I I think it'll get solved then. The two kind of, the two sort of ways in which most voice experiences tend to pan out is that it's either user-led or assistant led isn't it so the assistant led would be welcome to my fantastic skill you can go left or you can go right and then you'll say okay i want to go left and okay well now that you've gone left we've got a selection of things here you you can do this one that one or the other one that's kind of like assistant led whereas uh the other option is just for the user to guide the conversation and then you as you were just describing their brain and you would map every single one of those intents that you can possibly imagine and and kind of do it that way are you kind of of the mindset that um given that you didn't mention anything to do with assistant led kind of conversational experiences are you of the mindset that a voice experience should be user led and therefore the discoverability within a voice experience is all down to what the user asks for yeah, I, I think um, you know, so now that we're in the topic of you know situational design, um, I, I I I really think that it's going to be a mix of of user led and system led, and the reason I think this is it can't be entirely user led. I think that should be sort of the um, the beginning of the conversation. So, you know, a really good conversation would be like, "Hey, welcome to my app. You know, how can I help you?" And now the user can lead the conversation. But let's say you're ordering a pizza, for example, and you say, I want a large pepperoni pizza uh, for delivery. They give you all the slots you need, and now you're able to fulfill that intent to actually order the pizza. What you're now going to need to do is flip the conversation to system-led because at that point, the user cannot continue to lead the conversation. You know, now the system needs to take over and say, okay, here's what now, here's now what we need. We need your payment information and we need this, right? Um, you know, and then do you want to confirm the order? Yes or no. And so I think the future of conversational design, at least for the next couple of years, is going to be um, a mix of, of system initiative and user initiative. Um, I think every good conversation will start with user initiative and we're thinking a lot about this at voice flow. Um, but then, yeah, you're still going to need the, the, you're still going to need sort of, you know, your, your quote unquote flow chart um, just to finish off the conversation, at least in, at least in transactional skills, which I think will be most of them uh, over the next couple of years. This is some of the things that the, the BBC have been kind of trying to tackle. So their, their CBB skill, when we first spoke to Paul Jackson last year, uh, he was a senior designer on, on the project. And what he was saying is that they had a real hard time because it's, it's, this isn't a kind of utility or transaction based experience like that pizza order you just mentioned. This is more of a kind of experiential thing like a game or a story or whatever. And I think they had games and stories initially 
And what they kind of had is they had something like eight games and 12 stories or something like that. And they kind of, I think what they did is they, they asked if you want a game or a story. And then at the end, after that, they kind of, rather than saying, here's all the possibilities, I think they just picked two random ones and tried to do it that way. But now they've added songs into it. So now you can have a game, a story or a song. And I think that, I don't want to speak on behalf of the BBC, but it, it seems as though what they seem to be doing for the CBB skill, at least, is experimenting with different types of content, all within one skill. And so the skill over time is not just one interactive story. It's a little bit like, um, uh, what's a good example? I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure a volley might have even done. Oh, in fact, the ear player skill, the ear player skill is a prime example. Lots and lots of interactive stories all within one skill. Is that how is is that how you'd see things panning out in terms of one skill for everything? And if so, will we see more challenges in terms of discoverability within apps in future as those skills get iterated and more stuff put in there? Yeah, um, so we actually have a uh, pretty good insight here. So Storyflow, which uh, was actually an AirPlay competitor, that was our, our first company, and that was the Alexa skill we built, had 15 different stories within it. Uh, and each of those stories had different chapters, and we also had what we called the worlds, which were um, groups of stories with similar themes. So, for example, you'd have like a wizard uh, group of stories, so three stories, and each of those might have three chapters, so... Uh, we had a lot of you know, uh, compart- compartments within our, our particular Alexa skill. Um, and the reason that we did it that way is we actually felt that um, when we first started building voice apps, it was a big pain having to start from zero every single time we launched a new voice app. We were a long tail hobbyist um, building these Alexa skills and we'd have a popular story and we'd get some users for it. We did a ton of promotion. And then when we launched a new skill, it felt like we had to do it all over again. And that was a big pain for us. So, we decided to build this one, you know, mega skill. And that was actually a lot better. We had uh, content uh, that was tailored to that particular user. You had uh, rankings, So the user would actually rank the story and say whether they liked it or not. And based off whether they liked that story or not, it would recommend another story. Um, and so I think that's definitely um, sort of the way I think it's going to continue to go in the future. And I don't think it'll hinder discoverability within voice apps as long as, the one shot invocations and the intent structure. So like the interaction model, the intent structure is set up properly because um, at that point you should be able to ask for anything and it will be able to find the proper content within the app that you want to access. Um, It's when you start to use, um, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but like I'd say like two years ago or maybe even a year ago, uh, a lot of people were using, um, uh, catch all intents, which basically allowed you to use your own NLP NLU um, and then just have a single intent. But then the problem is you couldn't use one shot invocations uh, nearly as, as, as easily. So um, big apps like that uh, had a lot of trouble actually having in app discoverability. But um, yeah, to just sort of summarize, um, I do think that's what you're going to see a lot of entertainment and content apps start to do. Um, I don't know how well that's going to work in the transactional space. Like, I don't know whether Domino's will have one app for everything or several different apps. Uh, I'm not sure. And and then the other variable here is whether skill connections works out really well, because if it does, it might actually be easier for uh, maintenance purposes for, you know, the BBC to have 10 different apps that are all interconnected by skill connections. So, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a TBD on that one. Hmm. This next kind of, piece of the discussion should we say i think i'll throw to you justin because you actually put a pretty decent post on linkedin about this which is all about are we entering into the trough of disillusionment part of the hype cycle what what was your kind of meaning and intent behind that post and and we'll we'll throw it to Braden to see if if he uh what he thinks of it Yeah, I posted this up because I had had a number of conversations in the couple of weeks leading up to it where people independently said, oh, we're headed into this, we're headed into this. And what I wanted to say was, yeah, sure, (laughs) maybe. Uh, But I also think it doesn't really matter in some situations. Certainly, uh, I think we're going to be shaking the ecosystem of hobbyists in a lot of ways, hobbyists who were just trying things out. I think though that voice-driven interaction is here to stay. NLU is here to stay. My belief is that it's not going to be as focused on 
Alexa and Google Assistant as it is today, or Samsung or Siri or, or whatever, it's going to be spread out amongst a lot of things. It's going to be on mobile. It's going to be in websites. It's going to be in stores. But we also need to gird ourselves a little bit to prepare for this. And the way that we're going to get out of it is by people building useful things and and figuring out how to drive traffic that way, not worry about Amazon and Google to drive traffic. And also tool builders like VoiceFlow and, and others to continue making the process, lowering the bar to making these good applications. And so, Kane, what do you think? Do you think we're headed into the trough? Maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, I think the uh, we'll post the link to the the voicebot article that you mentioned it actually earlier, Braden, about the the number of skills that that are being produced and published on a daily basis has declined in uh, certainly in the UK and in America. Um, so maybe we are, maybe we are. I think that we've seen one of the for those that don't know about this, it's it's all part of the Gartner hype cycle, and essentially what that says is that the at, at the beginning there is a lot of hype and it kind of goes on this huge kind of hockey stick up on this on the graph if you can imagine the graph it goes right up and there's a huge hype and then it gets to a peak which they call a peak of inflated expectations and then the idea is that people experiment with this technology and then they kind of figure out and find out that maybe it's not living up to the hype and then you go through this trough of dis- disillusionment and the idea being that in that trough, the hype dies down. But as you mentioned, Dustin, tool makers and people kind of knuckle down and fix some of the problems that, that exist within the either the technology or what have you. And then it kind of goes uh, back up to the slope of enlightenment, which is just steady growth uh, from there on out. So I can kind of see that. I think that we've seen some signs of things that tend to happen if you were to take the hype cycle at its literal kind of uh, model, you know, the closing down of certain tooling com- companies um, and the kind of more kind of it just seems as though the, the, there's still a lot of articles produced um, but it's they're not all now kind of fanfare kind of like articles which are all praising there's a lot of questioning and a lot of kind of like um, analysis around the usefulness and all that kind of stuff so I think I think we may well be um, yeah I don't know what do you think Braden? Yeah, I think um, I think I have an interesting perspective on on this. As um, often when you're when you're a startup trying to raise money, um, the the hype cycle put out by Gardner uh, Gardner is is something that's brought up a lot. Um, what are the voice apps that people are building? Are they getting usage? Are they making money? If they're not making money, how are you going to make money? Um, and so I think. I think what's going to happen based off just a lot of the conversations I've had both with the platforms and, and other startups in the space, as well as even VCs who are um, seeing, looking at an incredible number of companies in the space and maybe not placing bets just yet is there's a lot of hype about the assistant platforms. And I think that's just because of the, the sheer number of smart uh, speaker units shipped. It, it is, it is colossal. Um, however, the, the software hasn't caught up yet. The hardware is being thrown out because, uh, or, or, or um, shipped at, at, a, at an incredible rate, but the, the software just certainly hasn't caught up yet. But because there's so much hardware out there now, and it's only going to continue to increase, especially with the new hardware, hardware announcement that Amazon had a couple weeks ago now, um, I think the voice assistants are here to stay. They're not going to go away. Um, I don't think if we go into a trough of disillusionment, which I think we will for voice assistants, I think as Dustin was saying, um, voice as an interface is only going to continue to go up. Uh, it's only going to in- increase in prevalence. It's going to, I think, have a big part to play on mobile in the next couple of years. I think that's something people aren't talking about enough and something we're thinking about a lot as well. Um, yeah, I think the assistants will have a trough. I don't think it'll be as deep as something like VR. Like they are in a very deep trough of sorrow right now. And I think that's partly because um, the hardware just never got put out. So there was no distribution whatsoever. Um, and that's starting to pick up now. But even still, they, they don't have nearly as much distribution as the two and a half billion voice assistants out there today. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think if we go into a trough, uh, it'll be short term. Uh, it'll be a couple of years, but the software just has to catch up. And I think... Um, a lot of people like to 
talk about, you know, a lot of people like to be contrarian these days. It's become a very popular opinion. So when things are going well, people always like to talk about the imminent downturn. Um, it's, it, yeah, I, I think, I think it's a common opinion that we're, we're about to go into a trough, but I don't know. It, our, our opinion at voice flow is, um, that might be true, but our, our goal is going to remain the same. Um, you know, we're only going to, um, get into the sort of the, the plane of enlightenment if we create a tool that allows people to build better conversations uh, and then therefore build better voice apps, better voice experiences for every platform, not just just voice apps. So, yeah, I don't know. I, we're just going to continue to do our job and uh, it doesn't scare me too, too much. I think that if anything, th- there still seems to be more interest and it seems to be from the conversations that we have, um, it's, not com- it, 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 it's not things like... Um, we do seem to have moved past the kind of random fa- fact skills, you know, as you mentioned earlier on. And this is one of the things I think I mentioned on Brett Kinsella's post that, that posted this article about the downturn in the number of skills produced is that I think that people are creating uh, better experiences, certainly more higher production value experiences. They're taking into consideration thing like, things like sonic branding. They're trying to make the conversation more natural. They're doing a hell of a lot of testing. And so inevitably, I think that it ends up being quite an intense piece of work to produce something that's good. And I think that what people have realised is that because the because of the likes of the discoverability issues that we've been speaking about and how, how uh, important it is to... to provide a good experience when people arrive. I'm, I'm of the mindset that the people are actually just taking a little bit more time and a bit more thought to get something right rather than just throwing something at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Another thing to bring up too is um, when you look at the, the rapid rise in skill numbers, a lot of that was uh, incentivized, right? You have the skill rewards programs and other things. And so, you know, pro developers and people who are going to make really top tier experiences are probably doing it professionally and they're going to do it for, they're not going to, they're not going to do it because they're going to get, win a free echo dot, right? That's going to be the hobbyists and um, folks who may just want to tinker around and play with it. It might, it might push them over the edge and maybe they'll build two skills this month. Um, those programs have really started to slow down. And so I think that that's probably the number one factor that has slowed down the, the, the number of Alexa skills uh, being built. Um, we do certainly see as much, um, enterprise and professional interest as we did last year, um, if not even more. I think I think you're um, you're actually starting to see the proliferation of voice product teams. Uh, I know that, for example, the the Royal Bank of Canada um, has their own voice team, and it's it's not you know the di- digital team. It's not just a single person in the back of the room. They have you know a director of voice, and this is something that you're starting to see more and more often. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's certainly uh, on the uptick in terms of the quality, as you mentioned. Um, the quantity shouldn't be something we're focusing on, but of course, it, it you know it makes a great great article piece. Hmm. They've got a good good. Um, they've used Siri quite well, Royal Bank of Canada. I remember seeing uh, one of their one of the people might be one of the people from that team actually uh, at the beginning of this year talking about how they've used Siri to to do things like check bank balances and stuff like that which is really uh, interesting the um I, I didn't realize Siri was that open to be honest in terms of banking but seemingly they've, they've managed to do something with it which is interesting um Dustin you all you you kind of talk quite a lot about about voice and mobile and and D- Braden, you mentioned it hasn't been covered quite as much um do you see that being more important in future and how will that kind of affect or, or change if it will voice flow? Yeah, I, I don't know how it will change voice flow. I think um, the cardinal sin of any startup is to uh, not have focus. And so our absolute focus is on Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant right now. And that's, you know, we still think we can uh create a better product by, you know, at least an order of magnitude, uh, if not a couple, um, just for Amazon Alexa, Google assistant. So no, no plans for, for anything else right now. But, um, I think in terms of the mobile space, it just makes sense, right? Like everyone has this microphone with a cloud connection in their pocket. Uh, it has a screen on it. They already have a vibrant, uh, app and developer ecosystem. 
Um, and I think when you look at the advantages of a voice interface, it's input speed, right? Like if I want to call an Uber, I've got my phone sitting on my table right now that I'm looking at. Um, it would be way faster for me to call an Uber via voice and then have the screen give me a confirmation and me tap a button than it would be for me to pick up my pick up my phone, unlock it, uh, have to open up the app or, you know, swipe over, find the app, open it up, go into the menu. Like it's just way faster. Voice is the fastest input speed other than like a direct neural connection. And, you know, that's not going to be for a couple of years if not a lot, lot longer. Um, so yeah, I, I think it makes perfect sense that that'll be the next evolution. I think TVs are going to be a huge um, place, to sp- uh, place to play because again, like, you know, having to have a peripheral remote to control this this screen is just ridiculous. It's it's archaic and we've had it for 50 years now. I should totally be able to control my, my TV entirely by voice and I already do that with a Chromecast at home. It's great. So yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more traditional devices that um, haven't been focused on as much, all of a sudden start to introduce voice interfaces at an accelerated pace. Have you seen the voice control on iOS 13? Ooh, I have I've not, but I'd love for you to talk about it a little bit. Have you, Dustin? I, Android only, again. Android uh, only. <laughs> I, don't know, I thought you might say that. Um, it is actually pretty good. I thought it would be... I thought it would be rubbish because, and the reason why I didn't like it initially, or the thought of it initially, was because at WWDC, Apple put it at the end of their presentation. It was more or less the last thing they said as they walked off the stage. And they put it under uh, the banner of accessibility, right? And I thought that was a, a trick a trick missed because if they'd have put it under the banner of Siri, they could have said that you can now control your entire phone with Siri. But what I like about it is that you, you can actually control your whole phone. So now I've got a stand you know, on my office desk and whenever I'm doing any work, I'll literally put my phone on the stand and I can do literally anything with my voice. Now, this is going to be a stupid demo because uh, nobody's going to be able to see what's going on, but I'll just give you an <laughs> idea. I'll just give you an idea of the speed in which I'm doing this task, right? And then And then I'll tell you what the task is afterwards, right? Hey Siri, enable voice control. Okay, I've turned on voice control. Right, I'll turn it up so you can hear. Open Twitter. Open Twitter. Show numbers. Show numbers. <laughs> this is making the tit of me this. I think I might be on the wrong Voices. Voice is the future. Voice is the future. Right, I'll try it again. I'll edit this. <laughs> Open Twitter. Show numbers. 14. Scroll down. Ah, I'll tell you what's happening. Ah, right. Ah, I've just learned something there. Right, what happens with voice control, boys and girls, if you ever try and use it? If you tilt your phone back... So that it's kind of like, you know, if you're on loudspeaker and you tilt your phone back and then you kind of speak down the mic, it turns it off. It turns it off. You need to have it kind of fairly upright. Right. I'll do it again. Open Twitter. Show numbers. 14. And now I'm on my notifications on Twitter, right? Scroll down. Scroll down. Show numbers. Seven. Now I'm viewing a tweet. Show numbers. 10. I've just liked someone's tweet. That's cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. It's, it sounds a bit like, you know, you've got to kind of say show numbers quite a lot, and that's a bit of a headache. But if you're in the middle of doing something else and you can just glance at your phone and then do literally any every single clickable thing on the phone has a number next to it and so you just tell tell it the number and over time if you learn the numbers then you can just say the number basically um i i I think that highlights a pretty a pretty important point um a lot of people think about voice as this like binary interface of i'm either going to use voice or i'm going to use a screen like the future of human computer interaction is going to be going to be tapping, typing, speaking, looking like it's all these interfaces have pros and cons, right? The pro voice is that it is frictionless, really fast and uh, really fast for input speed. And you don't need to have like a direct line of sight. You don't need to actually touch anything. Um, but it, it's not the perfect interface, right? Like it's in the future, you're going to use voice control some of the time and tapping some of the time. Like it's just going to be this awesome feature where you can choose whatever interface is best suited for that, for that particular setting. 
Perfect. Nice way to end. Braden, where can people reach out to you or, or follow what you're doing at Voice Flow or even try Voice Flow if they want to go and give it a go if they haven't already? Yeah, Voice Flow is free. You can check us out at voiceflow.com, uh, spelled how, how you would expect. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Reem Braden, so R E A M B R A T E N. It's been a pleasure. Braden, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Dustin. Kane, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Raider.